There are gaps in our financial and organizational innovation for scaling up and delivering these new technologies on that time frame. There is the inertia and the barriers represented by the old way of doing things, and not only regulatory barriers and old ways of regulating the industry, but also within the industry itself, old ways of doing things that don't quickly give way to the new practices and the new technologies, all of which will have to be successfully addressed to get to that destination of a sustainable housing stock by 2050. We wanted to point out that the strategy will have to make a clear distinction between the existing stock and the houses that will be built between now and 2030 or 2050. Three quarters of the housing that will be standing in 2030 is already built. This, and the technologies and the players and the business plans and everything else are quite different in these two segments. So you have to address them separately in the strategy. There's a big difference between high rise and single family dwellings that has to be acknowledged. And local context matters. This came up in a number of ways. Yes, we want a national strategy, but it has to work from coast to coast to coast. It has to reflect the fact that location matters, community matters, local circumstances matter. Houses, after all, are a large part of the way that we live. And when you start talking about changing them on this massive a scale, you're talking about changing the way that we live, ultimately. We came up with uh, a short list of priorities for the strategy to focus on, priority needs you might call them. The first one that came up over and over again is we need leadership. When you have a, an industry and a, and a sector like this with siloed thinking and old ways of doing things and outmoded regulations and everybody going every which way, it's really important that there be strong leadership, clearly defined targets, and there was strong support throughout our group for a return to the leadership role that many of us remember CMHC once playing in the housing sector, where it extended far beyond a financing and insurance role and into all kinds of research and policy leadership areas that we really need now if the housing sector is to deliver its share of uh, its contribution to our environmental and climate targets. Uh, in addition to leadership, there's a huge uh, capacity gap uh, between where we are and what we need to get there. We need training, we need education, we need, we think, probably close to a workforce of close to a million people to do this over the next 30 years. We think we can probably single-handedly address the country's unemployment problem by just tackling the housing retrofit challenge. We think that it's fundamentally economic. In other words, it doesn't have to cost the government money to do this but there are huge financing challenges. It's going to cost billions of dollars a year, probably into the hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 30 years to do this. It's actually comparable to the investment that already occurs in our housing sector, but if it's going to be organized and directed towards achieving the sustainability uh, target, we are going to have to have innovative ways of addressing the well-known problem of split incentives between the builders and the people that live in the buildings and all of the other issues that stand in the way of cost-effective investments and sustainability uh, and us actually scaling up that activity. I think that, you know, that covers uh, on a very high level uh, a discussion that would be, is impossible to capture in a short summary like this, all of the nuances, but we had lots of people recording those. One message that I'll just end with that came up over and over again was that in the end, this has to be better housing. It can't just be more sustainable housing. It can't just be lower carbon housing. We have to be able to say you can live better sustainably and sell that. And that in the end, if we can make sustainable housing better housing, then achieving those 2030 to 2050 targets is well within our technological, financial, and uh, um, industrial capacity in this country. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph, um, and thank you for the challenge and the reminder of the history of CMHC. We'll next hear about from the group that studied uh, homelessness, Stephen Gates. Come on up, Stephen.
thank you. I was told I have two minutes. Um, yeah, as a researcher, I thought anyway, if I adjust for inflation and population growth, it's three minutes anyway. So, so our group was looking at uh, homelessness, and I think I want to start by saying something that needs to be said. When we start down the road of talking about a national housing strategy, there's sometimes a tension there that it's about housing and not homelessness. And I just want to make this point. If you have something called a national housing strategy that doesn't address homelessness, it's neither national because it doesn't deal with the needs of our most vulnerable citizens, it's not about housing because it's not addressing their need for homes, and it's certainly not strategic. So we need, as part of our national housing strategy, a dedicated focus on homelessness within it. And this, in Canada, means doing things a little differently. I always say there are three things you can do to address homelessness, right? You can either prevent it, right, stop it from happening in the first place. You're going to need an emergency response because bad things will happen to people. And you need to get people out of homelessness. And for most of the past 30 years, most of our efforts and investment have gone into that middle piece, the crisis response, which has meant that people become mired in homelessness for years on end, sometimes 20 years, we started to move in the direction of housing first, which is good, getting people to exit, but we haven't done much on prevention. So with the national housing strategy, there's a real opportunity for the government of Canada to show leadership in Canada uh, in, in changing this situation. And so in our group, we came up with three things. Uh, the first is that the government of Canada should um, put in place a Canadian Interagency Council on Homelessness uh, that is legislated and reports to the the Prime Minister. It's an interagency council because what it will do is mandate the different relevant parts of the government who should have a role in homelessness, to, it will mandate them to demonstrate what they're doing about homelessness. So this means things like justice, health, not just the usual, you know, areas dealing with housing, employment, across all of the activities of government, there needs to be something that reports to the Prime Minister in order to change the direction. The second thing we've uh, argued is that the Government of Canada should plan and implement a rights-based homelessness prevention framework. This would move Canada from being behind the United States, for instance, to being ahead. Prevention is where it's at. We do not do enough to stop people from being homeless and we can continue with the best Housing First programs in the world but as long as the pipeline into homelessness continues, we're going to be scooping up the broken bodies at the bottom of the mountain for years to come. We need to go focus on prevention. And there's good ideas about how to do that, and Canada can become a leader in that. And the third thing we identified is that um, at every order of government, federal, provincial and territorial, local, community, municipal, uh, Indigenous, there needs to be uh, concrete, well thought out strategies to address homelessness that focus on prevention and ending homelessness. Not just community plans, but looking at service integration, looking at what we can do to change the dial and drive down the numbers on homelessness. Because in Canada, we've become a bit complacent. I think people think, well, there will always be homelessness. That's not the case. Mass homelessness is relatively new. And in Canada, if we want to end homelessness, we can do it, if we want to. So this is where the government of Canada can show great leadership in really turning the corner on a, a significant problem. And that was three minutes. Thank you, Stephen. Um, homelessness is indeed heartbreaking, and those are wise, wise words. Thank you. Uh, Sir, Somerville, Sir, Sir Somerville, I said that better than I did the first time, and I, I know Sir, so I'm, I'm sorry I'm torturing your name, will now address affordability in high price markets. You're not the first person. <laughs> no worries. Um, so let me start out with a, a profound thank you to, uh, to the government, to Minister Duclos and his office, and to CMHC for, for organizing this. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to learn as much as I have uh, from this whole process and the interaction with the 
diverse set of uh, colleagues and, and other people interested in these areas. So I think it's been uh, tremendously informative and a great exchange of ideas and, and hopefully will help with the national housing strategy. Um, our group had a number of areas that we focused on. We're dealing with uh, housing affordability in high-priced uh, cities. And the first thing we, we started on with a complete consensus was on supply uh, and that there's a need to uh, help aggressively increase supply and make that happen uh, in a more quick and timely fashion. And we saw the need for carrots and sticks from federal agencies and the federal level uh, for cities, suburbs, and provinces to help them deliver more supply. Uh, more supply ends up meaning more, more and greater density, which does have the advantage of being more climate change friendly. Uh, our second point has to deal with the whole issue of density and expectations management. So there's supply, but that's going to mean density, and density is going to mean expectations management. Um, on the one hand, it's going to help need to help people adjust to the fact that they may not be living in their parents' or grandparents' type of housing or type of community, that, um, that these cities are going to require people to have a change in what it is they expect to be able to have in terms of, of their housing going forward. At the same time, um, there's going to be a need for a change in expectations on existing residents. So those that have housing, um, particularly ownership housing, and have benefited from this huge price run-up are going to have to uh, have some change uh, in what they expect their neighborhood to look like going forward, that the status quo is really not operable. That leads us to this notion of haves versus have-nots um, and the federal role in addressing that. Uh, the haves are clearly those people who have housing and have benefited, particularly ownership, uh, and have benefited from a tremendous price run up in these um, expensive cities. The have-nots are those people who haven't benefited. But within the have-not group, there's, there's sort of two uh, segments, and those segments have very different needs when it comes to um, a federal response. Um, type one of, of the have-nots are essentially the people who are not able to get what they want in the form they want, where they want it. And this is really a, a group who can access the market and can get market housing, but not necessarily what it is that they believe um, they need or what, what they want. And our, our view here is that the federal government's role is really helping to, the, the market to uh, provide them with, with the best mix and the best set of choices. And so it's you know, making sure that the market is working smoothly. The second group um, is the, uh, the type of have-nots where the market cannot or will not supply them with appropriate housing at an appropriate price. And obviously the homeless are, or are, or would be the leading group here, but there are a whole range of low-income people who in an area of increasing income inequality and challenges from globalization um, are left out and will be increasingly left out, and we see that there's a, a, a need for an aggressive federal role there in terms of helping augment them either on the income side or in the provision of, of suitable housing, that that is a non-market and unavoidable role. The third broad area is information and data. Um, in terms of data, uh, the need for comprehensive, complete, and accessible uh, data that lets people within government and outside government entities um, basically measure the demand factors in these markets. You know, ideally knowing you know, who's buying, what type of unit, in what place, for what reason. Uh, that we have lots and lots of questions, particularly around the sort of foreign uh, capital area, uh, the, the issue of foreign capital, where we need the data to be able to analyze it. And going forward, we don't foresee this being less of an issue, and therefore the data needs are pretty acute. Um, the second area of information and data involves models and templates. And the notion here is that many local governments or local entities, like school boards, may have uh, assets, land that could be turned into, into housing and helping with housing, but they don't have the templates or the models for thinking about how to engage in the partnership with the public sector. And there's certainly a role here. Um, historically, CMHC has had a role in this area for providing the models and templates say, to help um, school boards uh, better utilize under underused resources. And finally, uh, an area which is um, in terms of market supply to affordable family options. And I think the idea here is concern about tenure security and that the need to make sure that uh, there are rental options that are family friendly that have secure tenure going forward. And that there's a role here in addressing some potential um, missing segments or protecting market failures in the coordination of demand and supply and sort of a role for the government there and, and this being especially acute in those high-end 
uh, expensive markets because those are the markets where people who might normally access home ownership um, are not going to be able to, but be able to have the mix of housing that's going to, to work for them. They can in the rental market, but the, the, what the market is delivering doesn't match their, their needs, even though if they did, they could, they could afford it. So that, I think, is hopefully a summary of my group, and if it's not, they will kill me on the way out. Um, but thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Excellent comments. Um, and I must say, I'm looking forward to seeing the ideas that you have so that I can answer Minister Duclos' challenge to us on the information and data front. So we'll rip those off faithfully. Um, the next subject matter was furthering the progressive realization of the right to housing through a national housing strategy. Excuse me. Monsieur Stéphane Codivo. Well, um, first, of course, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Duclos and CMHC and Mr. Siddell for the invitation of convening the event. It's, um, it's a great thing. I mean, for the last few years, it was not such obvious and such a smoothly, smooth, smoothly going process to be able to meet and exchange and, and have discussions. So we are very happy. And, and, and that's, that's not the result of my workshop. That's my personal comment, I must say. But we're really happy about it. So, um, and then as a workshop or as a roundtable report, the question we're also saying thank you for asking the question, is housing a human rights? Because that allow the whole discussion to evolve in a different direction. And to make a very short report, the answer is yes, housing is a human rights, and we should consider it through that lens. We should frame it in that context. The whole strategy should be thought as it's a human right. And we also want to underline the fact that among the groups that have been the most severely underserved by not adapting, adopting that um, framework uh, are the Aboriginal community in our society. Uh, the Aboriginal people should be looked, I mean, the, the housing issue, issue as a human right should be part and parcel and, uh, of the reconciliation issue with the Aboriginal people. And we think that human rights without serving that community would, be, would not be human rights. So we, we really want it to be central. Um, now, basically, it, it is a human right. And as such, it should be seen, the whole process should be seen. Defining the strategy should take that in consideration and the implementation of it, as well as the monitoring of the strategy itself, should take it into consideration. In terms of technicality, how it should be happening is that there should be some legislative framework that stated that housing is acknowledged as a human right in the Canadian context. So it means that there would be process that forbid discrimination, including social, financial, and cultural discrimination for the people to access uh, a proper housing. There should be an accountability process that allow you to challenge uh, the, the not, if you face a situation where that right is not being respected, you should have a body somewhere, somehow, that you can challenge saying, well, that right is not being, uh, it's not being answered back to me. Um, there should be a monitoring uh, that look at the result of those of the policy and the program that are being put in place in order to achieve that goal. And there should be outreach and education to attain support for housing development and um, uh, as well as housing provider. Um, the funding to the provinces and the municipality, because all of that must be done in a very Canadian way where everybody contribute one way or another and help each other and, and work in great collaboration, spirit of collaboration. <laughs> but still, province, municipality, uh, developer and provider uh, should uh, agree on goal and result and agree on, on mon clear monitoring process of those. Um, there, uh, uh, this morning, there was uh, the Minister of Environment who made us a statement. And so we understand that the Canadian government deal with the issue of environment with a great deal of respect these days, and we agree and we're happy with it. And we also want to link it that during the, the recent conference in Paris, um, I've got the statement in French, so, but it, it was clearly stating that We now recognize that sustainable development includes specific measures to reduce social inequalities, 
the right to have proper housing for everyone. So I'm, I'm getting to the end. I, I haven't seen the time, but I'm quite sure I'm within the time frame. Uh, Mr. Duclos and CMHCs and the Canadian government convened us, and um, we came and answered the question. The other question is, what's the role of the federal government? Well, basically, the role of the federal government is to lead. It should lead, it should fix bold objective. It should put in place the necessary means and program to achieve those objectives. You, as a government, have access to the financial and the political tool, as well as a strong network of collaborator and partner that are eager to work with you to achieve those goals. Housing is a human right, as as such, must be elevated to a priority to the Canadian government and the Canadian society to make sure that, as yourself, you wrote, Mr. Minister, the government of Canada believe that all Canadians deserve access to housing that meets their needs and that they can afford. So this is your statement. We are willing and eager to work with you. Let's do it together. Thank you, Stefan. We appreciate your ideas and uh, your challenges. It was meant to address, and, and I apologize to Sharon Chisholm because Stefan's just answered the question. What's the role of the federal government in housing? Come on up. My guess is you've got some more ideas that you can share with us. Come on up. The question is, what does a federal leadership role look like? I'm sure you do. cover the important ones. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I see a room full or almost full of gray-haired people that had a lot to do with building this fantastic uh, stock of affordable housing we have and may not be here over the long term. So a lot of our comments will be around sustainability and capacity building. You know, Canada had a very good housing system, probably envied in many of the countries I dealt with in the Western world. But now, sadly, that system is in crisis. And really, that's the only way to describe it. And our, we think that our only way of getting out of this is by having the federal government lead the way. The federal government has to figure out and show us the way out. So we, we thank them for identifying the problem, for putting the challenge in front of us, and, and we're happy to give advice. The federal government and all of us have to consider the full system not just nonprofit housing, but we have to consider how uh, private sector rental housing is doing, what the environment is like in those units, how we can make that environment better, what's happening to young people who thought they might be able to move out of their parents' homes and they're not able to do that, and, and they're staying at home, and, and it's a problem all around. And not only can they not afford a home of their own when they thought they might be able to, but as well, in many cities, they can't afford to rent a small apartment. So we have a major problem. But we affirm the federal role, and we see it, as many have already said, as a convener to mobilize our fiscal capacity as a country to respond, as a place for innovation and capacity building, for doing good research as it's done in the past, and we saw some brilliant models coming forward, particularly with a hurry in Australia, who is using a very knowledge exchange-based approach with a lot of discourse during the research, which makes for great results and learning throughout the process. Um, capacity building is important. Statistics are important but statistics in a timely way. We have seen core need statistics coming out three years after the date. So we need, if we're going to ask nonprofit housing providers and others to take business risks to go forward and build housing for which there will probably be no uh, guaranteed annual subsidies, we need to know what we're doing. We need to be able to act as businesses and have the data we need in a timely way. And we see in my work internationally that more and more nonprofits are in fact 
taking taking the roles beyond the nonprofit aspect, moving into other areas, and subsidizing the work that they're doing as nonprofits. We see them building houses for sale where that makes sense, so people are in nonprofits can move on. So in order to do that, we have to provide them with the tools they need to do a better job. Cities are in crises now, and it's no secret, it's in the news every day, but they play a big role in our success in doing housing, and I'll speak about that in a minute. Housing is one of the major economic drivers of a country, and it hasn't always been seen that way. And we can make a good contribution to productivity and to economic growth, but that depends very much on how our housing is done. That depends very much on where it's located, how close it is to jobs, if it empowers kids to get to school on time and have parents who can get home after work to help them with their homework. All of these things go together to make a country that can be more productive. And Canada suffers by long commute times when people are on roads in their cars instead of perhaps spending money to support the economy or doing other things that are productive. We think that Canada has to set bold goals, and that's been mentioned already, but that we need at least to add to the supply in a major way. At least 50,000 units, new units of housing should be built in the country every year. And we understand that work is needed to, to um, repair the rental housing that we have, to look at how housing responds to the environment, and many other important objectives that were, that were mentioned. But and on top of that, supply is the big issue that we have to address, and we have to start getting those units of housing out. At its height, the federal government, the minister's account, was about $2.2 billion a year. That might be able to help us, with assistance from many other sources, like municipalities, to build about 30 or 35,000 units a year. It's not all of what we need. So over time, that amount will likely need to be doubled. And we can't mess around with this. We can't say that we're going to do it for a lot less. Costs are higher, and we need to be able to act boldly if we want to have an impact. Um, finally, we, th we believe we're acting in a new paradigm. While we appreciate what CMHC did in the 70s, that role, which was really paternalistic, and gave us the money that we needed, the rules to do it, the regulations to operate our housing so that you could just follow that formula, go ahead and produce housing. Of course, groups did much more than that, and I'm not, I'm not negating that. But I'm just saying that that kind of role is not what we need for a new time. We need an enabling role from our federal institutions. We need collaboration across the country. We need CMHC to help us, or some federal body to help us to convene the experts and share knowledge. We need to be full partners at the table. Nonprofits, business partners, industry, municipalities, provinces, and so forth. So with that, I thank you very much, and I hope I stayed somewhat close to my timing. Thank you, Sharon, um, and indeed you were additive, so thank you. I was appointed CEO of CMHC in January 2014, and I started that day uh, by watching a hockey game in Detroit with my beloved Maple Leafs. I know, I just lost the room, right? <laughs> Um, the definition of fandom is faith in the, in the face of all evidence to the contrary, so we are definitive fans. And I took a drive around Detroit and I saw how horrible housing could be. Um, that was how I marked my first day on the job. And I said, well, thank goodness that doesn't happen in Canada. Well, I've since been on reserve and it happens here. I've seen the future and this is why we're here. And so thank you to all of you for spending so much time on this and undertaking a difficult job of summarizing your discussions. These few folks have just done that with us right now. So what's next? Um, CMHC will continue to support Minister Duclos by gathering... Oh, did I miss somebody? I skipped you. Shame on me. Thank you. Thank you for chairing the meeting in my absence. David M. Borsky. David Amborski would love to come up and tell us about innovative finance and social finance with, 
with my profound apologies. No problem. Because I want to hear this. <laughs> Sorry, David. No problem. Thank you very much. It's been a real great pleasure to be here today and, and learn a great deal um, from all the people who were involved in our session. Um, we looked at the challenges, of course, that had to be addressed. And one of the first things we came to the conclusion is 2.3 billion is not adequate. Probably every group allocated that funds to their issues and problems. Um, partly for that reason, we didn't really focus on subsidies. We focused on other things that could make things happen in the finance world. And we viewed access to capital as being something that has been very important in getting affordable housing built. A mismatch between the needs of even particularly small providers and also the capital market and not having access to things like pension funds. So we ended up with three kinds of solution areas. We looked at issues related to finance capital. We looked at issues related to equity capital. And we looked at problems with operating agreements. Now, the special issues we identified were that we didn't really want the feds to give us more money. We didn't talk about subsidies, but we're looking at ways to help find access to the funding that was needed in the equity side and trying to solve regulations and inconsistencies either within agencies or across agencies or across governments. So those things were deemed to be very important. We wanted to have openness and agreements. We also recognize that there is a need to be flexible. Flexibility is required because of different market conditions, different markets. It's also required because of different institutional constraints working with various provinces and municipalities. So all of those things came into play. And just to flesh out a little bit more detail on the three areas we talked about, first of all, on the finance capital, um, here we talked about trying to find better access to financing capital by the creation of a housing finance authority. And here we set up a number of proposals for how they should operate. We talked about the potential for using development bonds to have below market rates and the need to put a fund in place to make this integration happen to have access to the capital that's required. Then we also turned to looking at the equity capital. And here we talked about the establishment of a public prior affordable housing equity fund. Once again, a fund. And the idea was that you had an equity fund to bridge the gap between conventional financing, which might be about 75%, what the equity might be of a developer as a private sector developer of 10%, and the gap would be about 15% provided by this equity fund with patient money, patient capital, that might not take their interest or the return on that capital for eight to 15 years. We also recognize that the equity capital could be a larger component to provide deeper subsidies, it could be supplemented by co cooperation with provinces or municipalities. So a number of ways of engaging in this particular activity. Um, we'll also be a one-step window through CMHC to help facilitate this equity capital flowing. And the last issue had to do with the operating agreements. And people felt very strongly operating agreements are old, archaic, and restrictive. Um, so there's a need to readdress these operating agreements. Not only the operating agreements for new housing brought on stream, but look at the operating agreements that are currently in effect for other projects that are currently functioning. And again, part of the problem is that um, they don't really support social financing, social capital. So they're very restrictive in having that flow into place. So one of the thoughts was that there should be some analysis undertaken at looking when you stack capital, what the impediments are, what the issues are, go to the banks and say, what's the problem with this? What are the problems that are stacking? How can we change this? How can we rectify our structure? How can we rectify our financing agreements so we get conventional financing when we need it, along with the social capital that's required? So trying to put these things together. So the group was working on this and talked about having a more joint venture concept and trying to minimize the barriers involved in the operating agreements. So with that, I'll, I'll draw to a close. And those are the three themes we had, and thank you very much. Thank you, David. And again, my apologies to you and your group. In fact, it's, a, it's something we spend a lot of time on at CMHC and will proudly rip off your ideas. So thank you again. Um, so I'll just go back to what's next. I won't tell the Maple Leaf story again. Um, CMHC will continue to support Minister Duclos by gathering and analyzing all of the information from the various consultation processes. Of course, this week's roundtables and a meeting with national housing stakeholders that we'll be holding on September 19th and those ideas will create the pillars of Canada's national housing strategy. 
Minister Duclos will publish a report about what we heard. It will be published in November on Housing Day. And he will also announce the uh, next steps, the approval uh, step for the uh, national housing strategy by cabinet. So I don't want to uh, tell you uh, when we expect the uh, strategy to be uh, launched. I will let the minister answer this question. To again express our appreciation to all of you for being here today and for sharing your ideas and expertise with all of us. We've heard some terrific ideas over the past three days. I've just heard a bunch now, which we will be sharing with Minister Duclos and the Government of Canada in the days ahead. Sharon and a few others mentioned CMHC's convening role, and I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize the many, many colleagues of mine who are here um, who were very involved in putting together what I think has probably been the greatest collection of housing experts in the history of our country. So to my colleagues, thank you very, very much. Again, thank you to all of you for contributing so meaningfully to the development of Canada's national housing strategy. Bun fen and bun evening, and good evening. Have a good weekend.